Welcome everyone. Um, the original motivation for this webinar was the government's demand for councils to produce productivity plans over the summer. Um, but actually, I'm sure as many people have noticed, quite a lot's happened since then. So we were going to talk about how achieving genuine productivity isn't just about making cuts to things like EDI budgets or universal salami slicing of services, but there is a much more innovative way forward through more radical place leadership and collaboration. And to be honest, regardless of the election being called, all of this is still really, really relevant. If, as the polls suggest, Labour win the election, I don't think anyone, anyone is expecting Rachel Reeves to be sending out blank checks. So the fundamental challenge remains the framework within which councils are asked to respond to that challenge may change a bit. So before I go on, I just want to very quickly introduce our two guests. So I've got uh, Rob Whiteman, who is the Chief Executive of SIPFA, and Professor Donna Hall, who is Mutual Ventures non-executive and a former Chief Executive of Wigan Council. So before I bring Donna and Rob in to talk about this, I just want to give a little bit of an intro to the subject matter. So when Donna joined Mutual Ventures as a non-exec director last year, we had a conversation about the areas of public services that she thought needed real work. And the thing Donna mentioned immediately was the fact that at a local level, lots of services are still operating in silos. They're not centered around the, the person. And you know, despite many places having ambitious plans for better collaboration, across the country, organizations and services are still largely operating in silos which are not centered around a person's needs. So we started developing our radical place leadership approach. And Donna and I are currently starting work with a couple of areas around the country with more in the pipeline like Northeast Lincolnshire and, and Brent. And the work that we're doing there starts with analysis and the and baselining of where a place is in terms of its place leadership and how well the different organizations work together to provide support to people that really makes a difference. And as well as doing some technical work around identifying priorities and how you might measure progress, a huge emphasis is on culture and relationships and building trust between services and or organizations. So before bringing Donna in for some thoughts, just coming back to, to the government's productivity ask, there are some elements of which um, I think are relevant regardless of what happens on the 4th of July and do encourage a more radical and positive way of thinking. There are asks in there about operating models and transformation plans. There is a big emphasis on, on preventative approaches and also thinking about how places can use capital spending to better support support public services. And I think regardless of what happens on the 4th of July, this is really important. And this is something that every area can, can look at. And the discussion that we'll have today, myself, Rob and Donna, will delve into how these innovative approaches could positive, positively impact um, the design and delivery of services and reduce wasteful spending within organizations and systems. And I think there are three main drivers for the leaders of local organizations to be really thinking about how they can work together much better as a place. Number one is that I certainly think this is the only way to sustainable local public services. Now, individual services and organizations have been squeezed completely. Number two is do we have total place mark two coming down the line? There's been a lot of talk about it and a lot of um, potential government ministers after the 4th of July have been talking about, about total place and what a second version of that might look like. And then also local areas can choose to change the way they collaborate and deliver now. You don't need to wait for government to issue any guidance to do anything different. There are things that you can do right now in order to implement some of this and improve. And, you know, bearing in mind that any new government will need to do a spending review. So you might be waiting a year, 18 months for anything to, to occur. So that's my way of introduction. Um, we've got Rob and Donna here. Donna, I'm gonna to come to you first, just to give your thoughts on place leadership. And we're still thinking about this, I suppose, through the lens of productivity. 
even given the fact that maybe the the current ask of councils may not survive past the fourth of July. Oh, that's that's great. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Andrew, and hi everyone, and thanks very much for joining us this afternoon. It's brilliant to see so uh, so many people here, um, and I think people have obviously probably part way through doing their productivity plans now as we speak, thinking of um, all the things they're going to write in those documents. Um, but for me, the the guidance and the letter that came out to to local government doesn't really address the issue of cost around where cost actually lies in organisations. And I think I'd be really interested to hear Rob's views on this um, with his uh, SIPFA and financial hat on, and also as chair of an NHS organisation too, that um, often, you know, I, I think central government don't really understand the mess that they create. Um, I think somebody may be unmuted um, as well as myself. If, if yeah. that Rob, I was just going to say, Rob, would you mind just going on mute until I... Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think really there is a detailed understanding of where cost lies at the local level. Um, so the work that we did in Wigham and the work that I've done since and the work that I've seen being done amazingly well in other parts of the country more recently is where people actually start to look at where cost lies. And it isn't in many of the things that are mentioned in the letter, including equality and diversity training. That is certainly not where a huge amount of money lies if you're looking for productivity gains, either in the short, medium or long term. The bulk of costs lie in the repeated and multiple fruitless assessment and referrals that happen between different services on the ground in local communities, whether it's uh, a GP, whether it's mental health services, uh, whether it's housing, whether it's police, uh, whether it's council, whether it's adults or children's social care, um, it's that multiplicity of assessments and referrals. Uh, we found that that was 80% of our cost um, uh, in Wigan, 80% of our cost spent on pointless assessment and referral. And yet, what were we doing about that? Instead, initially, at the start of austerity, we decided to cut things like libraries and community centres and school crossing patrols. But that wasn't where costs lay. Um, I saw that some organisations cut their public health budget at the time, you know, because it was not seen as a <clears throat> statutory service. So people have closed um, non-statutory services. Um, because they see them as a as a quick way of, of saving money. But often uh, something that Mark Smith, the director of public service reform in Gateshead, often says is if you do make those kind of cuts, they end up costing the system a lot more in the long run um, because they end up resulting in more acute presentation, usually to A&E, to the front door of A&E, or to another bit of the pressurised system like adult or children's social care. So for me, if we're going to look at productivity in a meaningful sense, we need to combine it with really deep-rooted public service reform. And that's where you know, you're looking at where the cost lies, where the failure demand lies, where we completely ignore the person. We introduce new eligibility criteria if we've got a cut to a service. We ration services, which are very often not the services that people actually need or want, but they're the things that we think they want. And, um, you know, I think we've got to really try to reimagine our role um, as enablers and transformers of place, as place leaders and system leaders rather than just organisational leaders. You know, we've got new integrated care systems, 42 of them, hugely expensive to set up, you know, two and a half, two and a bit years in, what are they actually delivering on the ground? Have they become a mini version of NHS England? I don't feel local government are really firmly sat around that table still. I think local government still remain an afterthought in many systems. And are they really doing this deep dive into assessment and referral between different bits of the system? Or are they just introducing new projects overlayered on top of a, a very broken system? So those are my thoughts, Andrew. Sorry to splurge it all out there. <laughs> Sorry, Rob. Oh, that's absolutely fine, Donna. Just a, a follow-up question for me. And before I do, what I forgot to do at the start when I rushed to get going was just to do a little bit of housekeeping with the people listening. So if you've got a question, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window there to put a question to Rob, Donna, uh, or I, and I will do my best to get through those. But please do use that and put whatever questions you might have based on what you've heard. So Donna, just a quick follow-up question from me. So 
Um, you talk to a lot of chief executives, often through the work that we're doing together at Mutual Ventures. How, are you finding that the chief execs that you're talking to and the leaders in places are really up for doing something different? Yeah, I think the ones that we're working with, yes, because they realise that management of decline is not their job. And that's what we're being asked to do. Those productivity plans is just the management of decline. It's not investing in prevention. It's not looking at a different way of delivering public services and a new relationship between citizen and state, between the NHS, local government and, and citizens and patients. And that's what we really need. It's what people have touched on in various documents. I know NHS Confederation have, have mentioned it recently, but really making it real is what leaders and chief execs want to do. They want to try something different. I think the, the pandemic has, has taught us different ways of working are needed. That local mutual aid investment in the community and voluntary sector, investments in new models of care that are generally uh, out of hospital, that are supporting people to stay fit and well at home in their local communities, addressing things like loneliness and isolation and mental health are really essential. It isn't just about slicing bits of services and stopping EDI, definitely not. Thank you very much, Donna. Rob, I'd love to bring you in now. And um, it was really good to see you again. Rob was a guest on the Radical Reformers podcast last week. And Rob, I don't know whether you knew that you you were you were agreeing to two things with me, but it's it's great. I, to I, I see didn't. You back. I feel well and truly done over. <laughs> yeah, I've, yeah, I've conned you into it. But um, Rob, we're just um, you were talking you uh, um, in my intro there, just, just about is there a better way to respond to the to the productivity challenge through better place working? And I know you've got some really interesting thoughts around place budgeting and things like that. So I'm going to give the floor to you to say what you think. So the answer is yes, uh, and I'll talk about that in a moment. By the way, the, the worst job in Britain is following Donna Hall on a, on a, on a panel. I, I feel really hard done by. Um, just a little bit of context, because I think that talking about uh, place-based working isn't enough. We have to remember what's happened in the last 40 years. I've been in local government for 40 years probably tell from the grey hair. And when I started in local government, we were a self-funded sector. I mean, that was it. We were self-funding. We we raised uh, our own business rates and there was a direct link to businesses in your area. And of course, business rates got nationalised and now it's set at a national poundage and the government uh, retains half of it. And you levied a domestic rates and there was no referendum limit or anything so local government was self-funded and had been for a good hundred years and what we've seen progressively in the last 30 40 years is the fettering of local government so that it's now on its knees and relies on handout or you know dodgy accounting uh, authorized by the government capitalization directives are terrible aren't they as a means of covering the gap um, to, to borrow money or use capital receipts to pay this year's revenue gap. But local government has been reduced to its knees, really, over a period of decades. And at the same time that local government has been fettered and government has re removed the freedoms that it had at the beginning of my career and had had for a long time, it's also nationalised a lot. So, of course, it started after the war with the NHS. Fantastic play, if, if you've, any of you have seen Nye, with um, Michael Sheen. I haven't, but I'd like to. He has the argument with Morrison about why, why the National Health Service will be, why hospitals will be taken off council. The Lon London County Council was the biggest provider of hospitals uh, in the world, of which Morrison had been leader. So the little bit of context just at the beginning is to remember that we have a centralising government and they believe that they make a better job of things. So taking schools off councils as maintained schools and making them academies, they think leads to better management and that local government manage them poorly. Taking FE colleges away from councils and making them independent corporations. So I'll talk at the mo in a moment about 
place-based work. But just remember, we're sort of up against an enormous culture that central government wants to control every penny that local governments spend. And over a period of time, it has nationalised a lot of local government functions, believing that it will make a better job of them. And so although we now will talk about place-based working, I think we have to counter the argument and have an improvement model that co-designing services locally tailored to local demography is better than one sort of big, big Soviet style nationalised industry, which on the whole, you know, the government probably would like to have a national planning service or a national refuse service or all sorts of other things. But most of all, we have to counter the Treasury's belief that prevention doesn't work. And anybody that's worked in local government, think of Donna's distinguished career, people that have worked in health and housing and local government and policing, everybody knows, if you've worked on the front line, that those horizontal links between services, that people's health and housing and skills and drugs and social care, it's all tied up together horizontally, and that that's much more powerful than individual sort of vertical links from a spending department down to what it considers to be its service on the ground. And so I think it has to be radical one day. That, that we don't have local government. We have councils who are local institutions while much of local government is managed directly from Whitehall. And in the way that, and I'm sorry, I'm repeating something I said on your other podcast the other day, you know, in the way that radical devolution to Scotland meant that everything was devolved unless Westminster reserved it. It's not, not there wasn't a discussion about what gets devolved. Everything got devolved to Scotland unless Westminster explicitly reserved it. It reserved defence. It reserved immigration. It reserved counter-terrorism. It didn't reserve policing. So the Home Office has nothing to do with policing in Scotland, for example, because it wasn't reserved. So I think we all know that allocative productivity, spending money in the right place on these this horizontal link between services would ultimately save more money than technical productivity where you focus on one individual thing and a technical productivity is that you you get more bang for your buck out of one thing economies of scale or procurement but what donna was talking about with the repeat of assessment failing all the time because the other things aren't dealt with at the same time you help somebody with their housing, but what help is that if if they're unemployed or their kids are uh, are in constant trouble? But you have to public services locally have to do these things together, and I think we have to make a bigger argument that government is wrong and not very good at running things, and that they don't know what's best locally. And I love every civil servant I meet; I think they're all wonderful, but. The irony of total place that it became a national program managed by the civil service was sort of the and, it, and you know many strengths to it, but but it's wrong, isn't it? Every area has its own demography, it has its own needs. Some areas need a bit more probation than others. Other places need a bit more social care, but you can't vary things. You can only vary the things that a council run where most of local government is provided by central government and you can't take money or invest or do anything, you're, you're reduced. Local government has been reduced to a few local services and no ability to do anything about them because its finances have been fettered. So I, I think unless we make a broader argument that not only is prevention right to ultimately save the state money but actually the next government and the government after that will probably nationalize given half a chance because that's where all their instincts are 
I think we have to win the argument. And then, as you know, Andrew and Donna, I think we have to invent some new tools. And I'll I'll sort of take a break there. But my my fundamental belief is that, you know, accounting, and if I think of SIPs as role, it's a set of conventions that we all agree are right. But but they're just conventions. And mm. if we agree a set of conventions that we should measure prevention and we should invest in prevention and we should have business cases that take a 10-year view across different budgets and different outcomes, that could be a new convention and break yeah. away from this annual cycle of individual services. I'll take a breath. Thank you, Rob. Just a few few follow-up questions from me. Um, I, I was thinking about this over the weekend and I was listening to a podcast that was talking about the level of investment that takes place in the UK, not just, not just public sector, but private sector as, uh, mm-hmm. as well. And I think before I listened to that, I would have probably concluded that the public sector is probably not probably worse than investing in its future than the private sector. But actually what it was saying was that the level of investment in the private sector is is very low as well compared to our our um, you know economic neighbors. And is it just that we're not very good at investing in our future here and we don't we, we don't appreciate it because you you were talking about accounting conventions. And, you know, probably before I listened to that over the weekend, my question would have been along the lines of, well, in the private sector, they they can see yeah. how a, an investment, uh, you know, and can measure the anticipated return of that in the future. But it seems like we're not very good at doing that in the private sector either, which means that our infrastructure and everything that you might be investing in sort of crumbles. So I'm not sure if there's a Britain, question in there Britain, somewhere, Britain. but I'd like no, to no, Brit- Britain, Britain has many strengths. Um, we are an entrepreneurial country. We we are strong on research and invention. There's many, you know, inherent strengths in the in the British economy, but our weakness for a couple of decades has been low productivity. Why does it take a you know a German worker three days, something that a French worker makes in four days and a Brit- British worker makes in five days? And it's because including in the private sector. We, we don't invest in modernization and innovation to the degree that other economies do. Why is that long debate? But, but there's probably something about British productivity is poor because it's not easy to get investment. Our, our banks like, you know, sort of a fast buck where the City of London is where you go to make a lot of money. We don't have old-fashioned merchant banks like the German economy that invest in in manufacturing for for a longer term reasonable return and there's huge problems of labor mobility in the UK market and we don't and we don't generate the skills that we need so there are there's fundamental economic problems Andrew and in a way the public sector bears the brunt of that and then mm. public sector productivity focuses on the wrong thing i think you know Donna yeah. and I would say Productivity is about prevention to assuage chronic and acute need down the track. We yeah. just spend all our money on chronic and acute need down the track. And so our our productivity at times is poor. And, and remember that productivity and efficiency are different things. You can be more productive by producing more widgets for the same amount of money. But yeah. if their quality is poor, your efficiency goes down. So... There is a British problem on yeah. productivity, and I'm afraid that's a British problem that extends itself into the state where, you know, genuinely, you know, sit for works all around the world. I'm not just making this up. The UK state is the most centralised state in the developed world. And I'm not just saying that as a sort of, you know, debating point. It, it is the most centralised state, isn't it? The yeah. central government controls every penny and in effect every every service and um and i i fundamentally believe that that's a drag on our productivity and that emboldened yeah. local government can help enterprise and business to grow by skills and transport and housing and the things that affect the, the supply yeah. side things that affect the private sector and at the same time if people are healthier and they've got better education and public services are performing well, that then underpins 
the bigger economy as well. So I think yeah. local government could have a fantastic role to play. And there are people out there doing miraculous work against all the odds. I guess we'd just like to see a system which is designed to not need miracles. Yeah, yeah. No, I really appreciate that, Rob, and, and I agree very, very powerfully put. Donna, um, Rob mentioned there in terms of productivity, uh, the importance of innovation um, and, you know, investment in new new tools, technologies. But I think from our work, we've also realised that relationships play a huge role in increasing prevention and and ultimately increasing productivity you just want to make sure that, 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 that we get a, a good a good balance for people listening yeah definitely i mean i think just picking up on rob's point we don't invest proportionately anywhere near what other countries do on research and design do we and i think yeah. take principles of research and design that's in the private sector i don't think we do the same within local government and within the nhs I think because of this centralised state that Rob's really uh, articulately um, expounded, uh, which it really is, you know, I think maybe North Korea might be a little bit more centralised, but but that's it. You know, we are incredibly centralised. And because we've got used to it as public servants working in the system over the years, we just expect it. And it's, you know, it's the same in the NHS where people look upwards for the rules rather than outwards to communities for solutions and, and to partners for solutions. Um, so for me, the the investment in relationships, um, you know, R and D, relationships and design, um, and it's not just about relationships around a board table or in an integrated care system. It's those frontline people having that freedom to innovate between them, taking off their organisational identities, their lanyards, and working together for the place having key workers, case workers to support individuals and families who have got complex needs, you know, looking at a team around a school, for example, on mental health. So we all know that it's much more productive if we're talking through a productivity lens to invest in early help for young children in primary school who may be suffering from mental health issues. They might have domestic violence at home, all sorts going on in their lives. And very often we don't other agencies don't know what's going on in their lives because the police don't tell the school. The school don't know what's going on in the community. The um, social care system doesn't speak to anyone else. It's all separate organisations, all incredibly expensively run with an in separate inspection frameworks that don't work together. Um, and it's the relationships between those frontline professionals that we need to invest in. But if we were to invest in, for example, team around a school, mental health support, early intervention prevention, that costs hugely less than if a child's, you know, older, perhaps adolescent, presenting at A&E, having, having attempted to take their own lives and been on a waiting list for up to a year to access mental health support. The mental health system in this country is absolutely broken. It is on its knees. Um, so, you know, we know that it works. We know that it's cost effective. So let's liberate our teams to do it. And I think that's something that we can do I know today's a Tuesday, but it's something we can do on a Monday <laughs> um, weekend after a bank holiday. But it's something that, again, Gateshead keeps saying, loads of this stuff, we can actually do it despite the system. You know, we can get those early intervention teams based around a school. So rather than have people sat in their own, you know, separate organisations, we can get them based around families. We can do risk stratification to find out who's at risk of um, you know not being ready for school or having an unplanned hospital admission or falling into debt or being in a domestic violence relationship. We know it. We've got all the data in our systems. We don't combine that data. And because yeah. of the cuts that Rob's described to local government, they've disinvested very often in the very thing that's going to save them. They've disinvested in data analytics, not their fault because it's not seen as a statutory service. Um, and instead they've had to invest around 70% of the budgets in adults and children's social care. Do you remember the jaws of doom LGA diagram, Rob? It's happening now, isn't it? It's happening. What we predicted is actually happening. I'm afraid so. I mean, I, I'm afraid everything that was predicted came true. I mean, obviously, we, we must have a bit of hope now that change will occur. Um, but we do start from, I think, the most difficult base I've seen in my career. Would, would you agree, Donna? It's it's never felt like this, has it, with 
you know, massive backlogs of work and workforce shortages and all sorts of other things. And, um, and not, you know, that's not all a policy failure. COVID was a was a massive thing and so has led to backlogs of work in the criminal justice system or elective care in the NHS. But we have to have some once-off strategies to get rid of the, the backlog. But without a new model, without a new way of working, I, I don't think things will work anymore, ultimately. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really, yeah. you, know, you all know me, I'm the most optimistic person, glass is half full, you know. I, I mean, I, and it just won't work anymore, will it? I think, I think both of you are incredibly optimistic, actually. I mean, so Rob, so let me ask you a uh, follow-up question. So let's say we're in a place um, that's, you know, got a council, it's got a provider of mental health services, community health, adult social care. There's a really good, strong, voluntary community sector. There's a hospital in there as well that's part of a bigger acute trust. Say the leaders of these organisations get together and the culture mm. and relationships feel pretty good. But there's some things that they're working on together, like, for instance, um, the mental health for care leavers or something like that. Um, there's investment that's going to be needed in it. Um, the, the, the benefits are spread across all of those organizations in terms of cost avoidance in the future and things. How on earth do they manage to get together and agree how to budget for that sort of thing? Or sure. Because that, that feels to me like an area, and I know Donna, I would like Donna to come in in a minute and tell me that we shouldn't you know, fixate on budgets because it's about culture and letting people get on with it, but I just want to get this question in because it is a it is a question that the finance directors in those organizations come back and say, well, who's paying for that? And who's the con who where does the cost lie in the future? Yeah. So I think at the moment the, the way that we budget an account is based on our own organization and our own silo. And so where good initiatives occur, and I've seen so many over the years i think it relies on the goodwill of the leaders and you know what you just said andrew about you get people who want to work with each other they set the right culture they trust each other they get their leaders on joint development programs they create a sense of place they don't get fixated with footprint if not everything is on an identical fit footprint and they encourage people to do what's right with them with their money and then you will see incredible joint initiatives created at the front line around things like domestic violence or skills the trouble is you go back five years later and they're not necessarily there because the dna of of the way that we budget on my own organization this year drags things back in rough times and the first thing that gets cut is prevention so ultimately i think my advice to areas at the moment is as much fooled information as you can give yourself i think icbs were created at a difficult time with pressures in local government and pressures in health but surely one day with with partners local government and the police and health should look at their balance sheet and what assets have we got we should look at our budgets and where can we pull them. We know intellectually that for every pound you spend on a smoking cessation policy, you save seven pounds within a decade on acute respiratory disease. You know that if you lower pollution um, and pl plant trees by motorways, you know, you know that kids won't have chronic asthma. You can actually do something about future disease but we don't budget in that way andrew and so i i'm 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 with donna that it's not all about money i do think that culture and collaboration and leadership matters more than anything but i fear the i i, I think i think we can control any budget i think we can always stop ourselves overspending i think we can always make do with what we've got and people have got incredible skills at not doing with enough money, but we haven't got the tools and the skills to invest in prevention 
and reduce spending in five to ten years time because mm -hmm. we don't even try we haven't we have so my advice to areas think about a joint balance sheet think about a joint budget think about talking about yeah there's lovely examples donna from you know wigan where um was it the the, the you started to use your adaptation budget for people that were frequently attending a and e so this is this is existing money it's not new money but mm. you focused it at where it was causing problems for other other services and that that must be the right thing to do and i think we're going to have another go at it now i mean i think uh, don't don't you i i, I think sometime in the next year like or two there's going to be a go at this and yeah. the return of total place or whatever you want to call it is going to be back on the agenda. Well, t my questions on total place are coming up. So hold that right. thought, Rob. But, but before I do, Donna, just a thought on um, the the cultural relationship point and also just let's, let's assume that the department are going to continue to insist that the councils need to return the these these productivity plans how what what can be put into those that reflects the thinking that, that we're doing now and is it just about cutting things like edi budgets and stuff that's maybe as thought in certain quarters to be unnecessary i would start with um i'd look across all the agencies that are working together in that in that place whether it's acute hospitals, mm. health, housing, whatever. And I would take uh, a thousand people and I would map all of the interactions that those different agencies have had with those thousand people over a 10 year period. And I would see, and that will show you where your productivity, where you've got failure cost, you've got a huge amount of handoffs between different bits of the system, assessing and referring, introducing new criteria that tell people to go away become acute and then we'll help you you know we all know that <laughs> we all know the scenario we'll see a huge underutilization and um a parent child relationship with the community mm. we'll see community and voluntary sector organizations as an afterthought they're not stitched into the design we'll see services that are designed without the people they're designed for so very often they're things that are designed by people like you me and rob and other yeah you know, relatively affluent, well people, designing them for poor people who are really unwell without the input of people who are on the receiving end of those services very often. So, you know, a complete shift in the way that we do services. First and foremost, I think, as Rob said, is that's letting go from mm -hmm. central government departments. If there is a total place in the future, I know you're going to come to that, Andrew, but it mm -hmm. has to be driven through and by communities, combined authorities and integrated care systems so that, they are part of the policy development for their particular locality. It's not tightly constrained by civil servants and government ministers. Um, it's got to be, there's got to be the autonomy at the place level. Yeah. Mm. Um, just just as a, as a message to uh, people listening, I've just been told by our tech support that there's a problem with people submitting questions. So we're going to try and get that resolved, but apologies. And if I can get to them, Towards the end, I will get through as many as possible. But uh, apologies for that. Um, so let's let's talk about Total Place, right? Total Place was um, a program that was in place, I think, between two thousand eight and 20, 2010. and it was thirteen pilot areas that were um, that were invited to bid for support to set up a pool of local funding around a particular issue or group of issues. So it wasn't a comprehensive total place budget. It was around particular issues. And, um, you know, I think some, some places focused on domestic violence, crime reduction, poverty, care leavers, that type of thing. Um, I'd love to get your views on what you thought was really good about it and what you thought could be done better next time. Um, Rob, do you want to go first? I think the focus on, the focus on outcome was marvellous, and I think it made people think about the demography of their area, and it made people think about what Donna said earlier, the, the interrelation of multiple uh, visits, and it was astonishing, wasn't it, to realise just how many professionals were in touch with one family in a week. I mean, it, it was incredibly eye-opening um and, and i 
I think it didn't have long enough to go. I mean, you know, serious reform takes 10, 20 years, doesn't it? And I think we got to the place with with the pilots where they learnt an awful lot. And in a way, it's a shame that that got undone because had it had it been stuck with, we could have probably then iterated the learning into a broader set of outcomes. Um, and and that's the shame of it. But for me, not it 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 ended too soon because major reform needs a decade or more. Um, and I I hope that next time it gets longer. Yeah. Donna? Yeah, well, um, my predecessor, Joyce, you'll remember Joyce Redford, yeah. um, uh, Wigan led the Greater Manchester Total Place scheme. And there was lots of learning for, for all of the, for Wigan and for all of the 10 local authorities in Greater Manchester. In fact, if you read Andy Burnham's uh, public hmm. reform white paper, it's very much based on the principles of Total Place. I know Jim McMahon, who was the Oldham leader. Yeah. Uh, now really wanting chomping at the bit to do it for me it was yeah we learned what we thought we would learn that there's a mess it's a mess and it's all centrally tried to be gripped and the irony is it's not gripped at all it's just a mess and doesn't focus around the person so we learned that um what we didn't do then obviously because it was scrapped by you know for political reasons was was then take that learning and spread it across every aspect of public services whether it's the NHS or local government, predominantly local government that led it. But we know that that's the same in the NHS. Um, we know it's the same in DWP and in the criminal justice system. So why don't we very quickly, as we tried to do in Wigan with the deal, take the lessons from a pilot and then roll it out at scale and pace. We've not got the time to mess about and to try if you you know for five years to do pilots we've just got to you know we know it's a mess we've got to take a, take a leap of faith have the courage of our convictions to try a new model of place-based community-based neighborhood-based reform that starts with the person we do risk stratification we know where people live and we go in there with an early package of support multi-agency early package of support that's streamlined hell of a lot cheaper and a hell of a lot more effective I, I think that's right, Donna. And you know, we'd love to hear from areas councils that are want to think in this way. Um, it's really interesting to hear what different places are trying, and all, always up for for a conversation on that. So, um, in the follow up email, which I'll do, I'll, I'll obviously my my contact details will be in there. Um, I want to talk about mayoral combined authorities a bit now. So everything I'm hearing, I don't know what you two are hearing, is that the uh, potential new prime minister's office are very, very keen on the idea of mayoral combined authorities. I think they see it as, as an easier unit to, to get power down to in order to collaborate a bit better, you know, easier to do it from that kind of reasonably newish structure than trying to break down the walls between government departments in mm. in Whitehall, which I think um, I, I've actually heard a number of l Labour ministers kind of saying that they, they won't be trying to attack that anytime soon. So Merrill Combined Authority is obviously a very mature one in, in Greater Manchester, newer ones around the country. What What's the role there with regards to both driving productivity, driving um, economic growth, but also something they haven't been that focused on up until now, perhaps, is focusing on really uh, encouraging collaboration between public services. Rob, do you have a mm -hmm. thought on that? So interestingly, devolution deals are varied by area and the, the scope of of a combined authority and what the mayor's interested in has varied by area, isn't it? So um, Andy Street, who just lost office, was really interested in the economy um, and and not particular, I don't mean that pejoratively, but not particularly interested in the health economy and the NHS, whereas Andy Burnham uh, in the Northwest sees the combined authority as being a key player in, in health. I, I suspect what we'll see, forget London for a second, because London is just so big that it's sort of it's a different it's a different set of propositions, isn't it? But um 
I guess my question for everybody is, if, if your combined authority started to be responsible for pooling budget from Whitehall into a region, would that be a good thing? And I think the answer to that is yes. But I think it would be quite controversial because, you know, you get local versus regional here as well. My argument is that, oh, no, I was a London Borough Chief Executive, and when that was formed 50 years ago, we looked after all children and every and everybody only in, in the boundary of our borough. Now, now we've got, that same borough's got people in Kent, and that's the, <laughs> you know, the footprint of delivery is much bigger. And so personally, I'm very comfortable if the way that you get devolution is saying the mayor of the northwest let's say andy burnham is commissioning health budgets and can reprioritize health money instead of whitehall but the same for social care and the same for education and that actually skills these budgets i don't think government will devolve them always to a local authority unit so perhaps mayor, mayors and combined authorities are the way forward to get devolution um, because ultimately we've got to pay more money as well. We need more quantum. And I can't imagine my local council putting up my income tax, or, um, but I can imagine the mayor of London or the mayor of Greater Manchester saying we're going to pay a bit more income tax because this is what we want to do. So... I yeah. I think we're at the beginning of a journey where in the first instance we will see standardization of combined authorities for regeneration purposes across the country and all areas will have a mayor and a combined authority and that will be about regeneration and growth. After that, I think that there's it's probably an easier proposition to hang devolution on that. My argument, you know, Scotland interestingly was to a whole a country wasn't it it got devolved from westminster en masse and so i think andrew i would I, I imagine in a few years time a number of us will be arguing that the best way to get devolution and tax raising powers is to hang more on combined authorities and that say in greater manchester or or London or any combined authority, the elected mayor has a role in the allocation of resources to that region that has been devolved to them from Whitehall. And that yeah. would be more than regeneration. It would be a range of frontline budgets too. I think that's really interesting. And on, on the podcast conversation, you and I were talking about some of the services that could could be yes. could be that that would benefit from collaboration across a larger footprint and there are you know we do in mutual ventures quite a lot of work in children's services and there are already regional clusters emerging yeah. for things like fostering and commissioning of residential care is yeah. one being explored right now so Linking those up with mayoral combined authorities could could be quite interesting in the future, but it would take a bit of doing to bring everything because they're not always on the same footprints, obviously, because that would be yeah. too easy. Um, Donna, what what are your views on mayoral combined authorities and collaboration between councils more generally? I think a really exciting model. Um, the only thing for me is I don't think we should have separate integrated care boards and and CAs. I think the two should come together. Um, and I think they should be really accountable to local people. Um, much more work needed on the dem democratisation, not just voting for the mayor, but voting for um, you know, a local cabinet, a little bit like a, a German federalised model. I think that's the reason yeah. Germany is so productive, is it has got this federal devolved system yeah. in place where things are brought together at the local level. Um, the reason we are very keen on reform in Greater Manchester and the reason Andy uh, really pushed reform as well as growth, we had a twin track strategy of growth and reform, the two of equal significance, because we felt the two mutually 
um, were connected to each other in a symbiotic relationship. We did a 15 years ago, a, a massive multi-million pound study into what was holding Greater Manchester back. Why was Greater Manchester a net drain on the national economy rather than a net contributor to the national economy? And we called it the Manchester Independent Economic Review. And there were two things that stuck out as being the real reason we were held back. One was health the health of our population. We weren't able, there were too many people off long-term sick to make us productive and competitive. And the second was early years. You know, so the early years system wasn't working well to ensure people were school ready at the age of three or four. So that's what we decided to focus on. I led for Andy on reform and, you know, Andy gave an equal significance to both of those aspects of the GM strategy. So I think that's what the ideal CA should look like. Give those two equal weightings and roll these two organisations together, ICBs and CAs. You've got some brilliant questions in the chat, you know, Andrew, around this very topic. Can you see them? I I can't see them at all, Donna. I I, I don't really oh, know what's going on here. Fabulous. Shall I read them out? To well, yeah, when you go on, Donna. We need, yeah, we, need, on. we need you here. There's one here that's an anonymous attendee, and I understand why, but it's a question I've asked myself many times. How do you influence the mindset of place executive leads in ICSs to step out of their comfort zone and consider greater horizontal devolution of power and budget at the local area level when they're rooted in an organisation that's so centralised and siloed? That's a blooming good question. I'd say anonymous <laughs> if, if, if I were you. Um I don't know what you think, Donna. If I just step back from this, probably probably the real power in the NHS still resides with the region, and a lot of things that ICBs work on still need approval of the region. And so there is this unequal relationship where a lot of ICBs become health regulators, and and, and yet the region is still the ultimate regulator and i and then i think local government people think well why am i sat around the table if i'm doing health regulation all the time so i think we probably have to go back to first principles and try and think yeah. what what's the purpose of system working and regulation i chair a large acute but is the regulation of a large acute part of what what the i you know is that going to get local government to the table the yeah. budget will and commissioning will and primary care will and integration will and social care. But if our council leaders and our chief execs have to go along and hear blow by blow what's happening on the latest planning round to try and set a balanced budget for the acutes, it's yeah. not really a good use of their time, is it? Are, are are there any more, Donna, we can get to? I'm really Maybe sorry, one. everybody. I, I can't can I, see them. Can I read them out? I yeah, feel go for it. Go for it. Okay, so Penelope Shrub, uh, this is a great one. Should regulators and inspectorates be able to hold joint inspections and investigations and publish joint reports as the ombudsman can and have done to help improve public services to make them more productive, effective and efficient? A really good question. I think definitely. It's a great question. So the, other thing, the other thing as well, it would be good to sort of get regulators to look more broadly, wouldn't it? And and yeah. think about, I, I worry about regulation. I, I'm sorry to have a bit of a thing here, but I, I'd probably prefer that CQC or Ofsted inspectors were drawn from people that are still in practice who get seconded into, into regulation and then go back into practice. I think when people go into full-time inspection of one thing, they lose their humility um, and, and lose the real world of what's going on. So I think the idea, Donna, of not only joint inspections, but more practitioners being involved who are still yeah. current in practice. I, I'd, I mean, in the old days, school inspectors were still teachers, weren't they, when we were little? Yeah. You know, and then we've made a, we've made a job out of it. But the, I, I, I do feel quite strongly that CQC and Ofsted have lost their humility and 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 the dreadful events of what you see on one word um outcomes um to you know a school an outstanding school becoming inadequate overnight because of one thing it's terrible i yeah. mean that, that that's not proper government is it 
No. Donna, is there another one that you'd like to answer yourself that you could read out? And I'm sorry you're having to read your own oh, questions. No, 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 there's two amazing ones. Can I squeeze right. two in really quickly? Yeah, yeah, if you, if you can is, answer them as well. Yeah. One is from my friend Alexandra Ryan, who says um, that she hears what we're saying about academies and privatisation, um, but how does this messaging sit next to the evidence about privatised placements, for example, in children's services? It's taken over the market hugely, costs a fortune with terrible outcomes. Uh, Rob, what do you think? Well, you answer, Donna. Right? You keep asking the questions, and then I'm answering Great. them. I think we I must. Think... I think we must encourage you to answer as well. Yeah. I think we, need, we need local services that are not privatised, that are in the control of local communities, where they are early intervention, early help, yeah. to keep and support families together. Not this tick box culture. We also need to differentiate between children who are at risk of being harmed by the parents and children who are in families where there is a huge amount of poverty, deprivation, and the needs of the parents are not being met. And currently those two are all mixed up together in the care system. It needs completely redesigning, as Josh McAllister said. I'll ask the final question now, which is a really cracking one. Um, so picking up the point about the community not being at the centre, I don't believe anyone actually asks what the community expect for service provision or what the outcomes should be for them. Our needs are assessed, but not what outcomes we want. Does this impact on the ability of public services to be productive? Thank you. Donna, you yeah, answer that first as well. Yeah, no, this, this is All your right. area, Donna. I've yeah, got, yeah, I just think we've missed a trick completely. We had no money in Wigan. We had to make £160 million worth of savings, huge amount of pressures, third worst cut council in the whole of the UK. Uh, according to the Institute of Fiscal Studies, but we had 323,000 brilliant people. They were the strengths that we built yes. on, you know, and that is where we're going wrong in public services. We have a transactional parent-child relationship. We need a new social contract where we work together as equal partners, uh, not in a patronising way. I really, I really, I really believe that. Um, yeah, it's, people who know know me well know my my dear old mum died before Christmas. She was ninety four. Never, never had a day in hospital. Um, lived completely independently and did her own shopping and everything else. But you know what? I wish I could sort of shake everybody's hand that helped her on and off a bus. And so, because actually, it, you know, where I was brought up in the East End, it's a strong community, mm. and people come together and do think about the elderly it's uh you know and do think about looking out for their neighbors and that is much more powerful donna isn't it you know it's much more powerful when the community itself bears some responsibility and and it's not a bad thing it's it's a, it's an honor i mean it's an honor to for that sort of thing to happen and i i sort of think with my Mum, if she'd lived in some other parts of the country, I think she would have probably become isolated or not be able to get on and off the bus. But there's something about where we live where, of course, everybody helped her. Um, and so she lived completely independently till the day she died. And a good thing. A, a, a good life by the signs of it, Rob. Um, just to say a huge thank you to Donna and, and Rob. Donna, thanks so much for for being quiz master at the end there. I don't know what happened to my tech. I've done hundreds of these things and I've obviously still haven't worked it out. So thank you everybody for, for staying with us and listening. Great conversation. I will send some follow-up materials to people so you can re-engage in this conversation, but have a great rest of your day. Thank you.